afternoon agenda on GB News, 4 till 6, Monday to Thursday. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We'd love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Good afternoon, it's time to debate the big issues of the day with me, Gloria Di Piero, Liam Gallagher, a whole host of great guests. Today we're asking, are you ready for these new anti-Covid restrictions? But first, it's the GB News headlines with Olivia Guthrie. Good afternoon, this is your news at two o'clock. The Cabinet Secretary will now investigate three alleged parties in Downing Street and Whitehall during lockdown last year. During urgent questions in the House of Commons, Cabinet Minister Michael Ellis said they're looking into several claims. It comes after a leaked video showing Number 10 staff laughing about an alleged Downing Street party forced the resignation of government aide Allegra Stratton. Here's what the Paymaster General had to say in the Commons earlier. Now, I can confirm to the House that the Cabinet Secretary's investigation will establish the facts surrounding the following. Allegations made of a gathering at Number 10 Downing Street on the 27th of November 2020, a gathering at the Department for Education on the 10th of December 2020, and allegations made of a gathering at number 10 Downing Street on the 18th of December 2020. Meanwhile, Boris Johnson is facing a revolt from Tory backbenchers who are questioning the government's credibility in enforcing England's Plan B Covid rules. New restrictions include extending mandatory masks to indoor public venues such as cinemas and theatres, whilst guidance to work from home where possible will return on Monday. Mr Johnson has denied bringing forward announcements to divert attention away from the row. Conservative MP Andrew Rossendale has told GB News he'll vote against the measures. I understand why, when the pandemic hit to begin with, none of us knew what we were facing and the government was right to take action. Since then, I think that it has been a huge overreaction and we're not calculating the effects of lockdowns. So why at this very point, when uh, we're looking forward to Christmas, when businesses are really at their peak in terms of what they need to do for Christmas, to then restrict things, I don't really understand why we're doing it. 
Well, Dominic Robb and Grant Shapps are self-isolating after being in contact with the Australian Deputy Prime Minister, who's since tested positive for coronavirus. Barnaby Joyce confirmed the news while travelling in Washington, D.C. The ministers had both met Mr Joyce when he was in London earlier in the week. Scottish Conservative leader Douglas Ross is also self-isolating after a member of his staff tested positive. Boris Johnson's facing renewed questions into a donation used to pay for the redecoration of his Downing Street flat. It comes after the Conservative Party was fined almost £18,000 by the Electoral Commission. It says the Tories failed to accurately report a donation and keep a proper accounting record. Party spokesperson says they're considering an appeal. The Scottish budget will be unveiled at Holyrood later, with the Finance Secretary saying it will provide stability and support. Kate Forbes will outline her draft tax and spending plans for next year and 2023 to MSPs in the first budget to be put forward jointly by the SNP and Scottish Greens. But the Scottish Conservatives say spending must support hard-pressed businesses by providing firms in the leisure, hospitality, retail and newspaper sectors with a 75% rates rebate. Nearly one in four people celebrating Christmas will struggle to afford it this year. That's according to research from a national debt charity. Step Change found that one in 12 will borrow to pay for festive spending, with a quarter taking a year or more to pay the money back. Those who are borrowing say rising household costs, reduced income and the recent loss of the temporary uplift to universal credit are among the reasons. The aircraft carrier HMS Queen Elizabeth is returning home today following the loss of a £100 million fighter jet at sea. The Royal Navy flagship had originally been expected to return to Portsmouth tomorrow, but that was brought forward due to concerns about the weather. In November, an F-35B Lightning jet crashed into the Mediterranean after tumbling off the flight deck. The jet's pilot escaped unharmed. A member of the carrier's crew has been arrested on suspicion of leaking video footage of the incident. Boris Johnson and his wife Carrie have announced the birth of a baby girl at a London hospital earlier today. It's the couple's second child after the birth of their son Wilfred in April 2020. A spokeswoman for the couple said both mother and daughter are doing very well. You're right up to date. I'll bring you the latest headlines in half an hour. Now back to Gloria and Liam. Coming up today on De Pierre and Halligan, Plan B. After Boris Johnson announced new restrictions for England, are you ready for them? Last night he said this about working from home. We will reintroduce the guidance to work from home guidance to work from home. Employers should use the rest of the week to discuss working arrangements with their employees, but from Monday, you should work from home if you can. Go to work if you must, but work from home if you can, all right? I know this will be hard uh, for, uh, for many people, but by reducing your contacts in the workplace, you will help slow transmission. Confused? We'll try and unravel the restrictions for you. Later in the show, we'll be debating how these restrictions will be affecting businesses and asking, is the government going too far or going far enough to limit the spread of the Omicron variant? But it's not just our guests we want to hear from, of course. Join the debate with your views. Email gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. Right, let's see who our first guest is. Um, we'll be, we want to know what you think about this. And we've started a poll over on the GB News Twitter page. People in England are being asked to work from home again if possible and face masks will be compulsory in most public places as part of new rules to limit the spread of Omicron announced by the Prime Minister last night. But what are all the restrictions? Does the Prime Minister have cross-party support for them? GB News' national reporter Paul Hawkins is at Downing Street now. Paul, good to see you with the Christmas tree in the background. Just outline for viewers, they may have missed the news this morning, what Plan B actually is. 
Right, so Plan B, let's just run through. There are three parts to Plan B that's come in, OK? So from Friday, you'll have to wear face masks in more public settings. So that includes places like theatres and the cinema. Then from Monday, the working from home guidance kicks back in. So if you can work from home, do work from home. And then from Wednesday, and this is probably the most controversial part of these new Plan B measures, the NHS COVID pass comes into action in England and effectively it will mean that you have to show proof that you've been double jabbed or that you have had a negative lateral flow test if you want to get into a large scale venue like a nightclub or uh, an indoor standing venue with more than 500 people, an outdoor standing venue of over 4,000 people or any event with more than 10,000 people. So uh, a big implications there for the hospitality industry and essentially the point of this is to slow the spread of the Omicron variant which is doubling every two to three days they say. Uh, and the government wanting, it says, to bring in these restrictions uh, because um, it's worried about uh, hospitalisation rates increasing, um, pushed up by the uh, Omicron variant. At the moment, we have to say hospital hospitalisation rates at the moment in the country slightly falling, uh, COVID infection rates slightly rising. But the government is worried that the rise of Omicron within those COVID infection rates is going to push up infection rates and potentially the NHS could be overwhelmed in two to three, two to three weeks' time. So it's uh, a, a kind of a case of the government saying, well, let's get ahead of the curve now, do these small things now, and then we don't have to do big things like lockdown later. At least that is what the government is claiming is the reason for bringing in these Plan B measures. But, um, uh, yeah, the Nighttime Industries Association, they've said that this NHS COVID pass will have a devastating impact. They've pointed to Scotland and Wales, which already has NHS COVID passes, saying that they've seen a drop-off in trade of 26 to 30%. Um, and they've also cited a government report in June which said that bringing in NHS COVID passes would discourage people from uh, going to nightclubs and also uh, bringing them in would be out of proportion to public health benefits. And indeed, that's one of the reasons why a significant number of the uh, Conservative Party backbenchers are unhappy with these measures. They say it's out of proportion, it's not necessary at the moment. Um, and uh, they're saying that a, lot, a significant number of them will not vote for it when it's put to the Commons retrospective uh, next Tuesday. Marcus Fish, uh, the Conservative MP, has called it draconian. He said it's an utter disgrace. Uh, William Ragg, uh, yesterday he was heckling the Health Secretary, calling for him to resign while he was reading out the Plan B measures. Uh, and Steve Baker uh, is urging MPs not to vote for it. Yes, there's uh, lots of Tory disquiet. But what are Labour doing? Is it going to go through, Paul? It will still pass, yeah. It, we're in that weird position where the Prime Minister can't rely on his own party because there's that significant backbench rebellion threat. So Labour are going to vote with the government to put through these measures. So uh, the Prime Minister relying on Labour to get these Plan B measures through. Uh, Labour, on the other hand, though, they're willing to support the Prime Minister when it comes to the Plan B measures. They are, however... Uh, still uh, trying the best they can to, to, to make as much political capital as they can out of the allegations about parties here at Downing Street. And what is the latest on those allegations about parties, Paul? I guess we don't use, have, have to use the word allegations anymore because the government front bench has just admitted that there's a triple investigation going on. Well, yeah, you say that, Liam. I mean, there's no concrete evidence, which the Prime Minister would say is why we're having this investigation, although he did initially say that he was satisfied uh, that no COVID rules have been broken. Then, of course, the video emerged and then he rode back slightly saying, actually, we will have an investigation to find out the facts of the party that never happened. It sounds confusing. It is confusing. But the latest is that this uh, independent inquiry by Simon Case, he's the uh, Cabinet Secretary is the head of the civil service. He's the, basically the boss of the staff here at Number 10. Uh, his inquiry is not just going to cover the events around December the 18th, which have been much publicised, if indeed they did ever happen. Uh, the remit of the inquiry is also going to cover the dates of the 27th of November and the 10th of December. There were gatherings uh, allegedly taken, uh, alleged to have said to have taken place here at Number 10. So the inquiry will cover those. Uh, any criminality will be reported to the police, but the inquiry will not include the dates of uh, the 13th of November when another gathering was said to have taken place here at Downing Street, uh, nor the 14th of December uh, when a gathering took place at the Conservative Party headquarters. Uh, 
four people from that gathering have been disciplined. So the inquiry looking at three dates, uh, the 27th of November, the 18th of December, and sorry, I should say the 10th of December, that was a gathering at the um, uh, Department uh, of Education. Uh, there was a gathering there. They have confirmed that did happen. Uh, the most senior civil servant in the department said that uh, around two dozen people were there at the time. She said that was organised by the then Education Secretary, Gavin Williamson, but that party will form uh, part of this investigation. And it's another reason why those Conservative Party backbenchers are unhappy with their leader. They're unhappy with the way he's handled this crisis. A lot of them are saying, why didn't he just put his hands up in the first place, say, I'm... I'm uh, uh, I don't know what happened. I'll hold an inquiry. I'm sorry if there was any wrongdoing. But the fact that straight out he came out with a straight bat and just said that simply no COVID rules have been broken. And then that video emerged on Tuesday night. So now he's had to row back and launch this investigation. He will hope that that investigation, along with that resignation from Allegra Stratton yesterday, he's hoping that that will neutralise this story, at least in the absence of any further evidence of any parties. And if politics has been given the Prime Minister sleepless nights of late, something happier might be giving him sleepless nights going forward, Paul. Yeah, the, it, was, it was announced uh, earlier today that uh, he's had a little girl uh, born this morning. Uh, apparently, baby and mother are both uh, doing well. This is the Prime Minister's seventh child, his second with uh, Carrie Johnson. They, of course, have a little boy, Wilf, who's turning two in April. So some really good news for the Prime Minister this morning, uh, especially when... These problems with his uh, political life, uh, with his career uh, uh, surrounding him, uh, we should add as well, by the way, uh, the Conservative Party fined £17,800 for failing to accurately report a donation uh, that paid for the PM's flat refurbishment. So that as well in the PM's in-tray to deal with. But uh, the uh, uh, number 10 here, they're saying that the PM will take some time off uh, so we can spend some time with his uh, new arrival and uh, uh, a nice little arrival as well too for Wilf, who's now got a little, a little sister uh, who he can play with. So, yeah, uh, that's the good news for Boris Johnson, but still uh, lots to contend with. And he'll be hoping that uh, no other evidence emerges, concrete evidence of parties here at Downing Street, because if any does, then this party will leap straight onto the front pages again. Life comes up you fast especially when you're the Prime Minister. Paul Hawkins there, GB News national correspondent outside number 10. The hope is that the new restrictions in England will slow the spread of the Omicron variant, but will they? Azeem Majid is Professor of Primary Care and Public Health at Imperial College London, and he joins us now. Welcome back. Good to see you again. Um, it's reported that Michael Gove, um, the Cabinet Minister for Leveling Up, raised concerns at the Cabinet meeting that these restrictions may not go far enough. Do you think they will? Uh, I think for now they're reasonable measures. So we're expanding, extending the face uh, mask mandates, uh, bringing requirements for use of the COVID pass, uh, asking people to work from home if possible. So I think these measures are, are now you know, reasonable for now. At this stage, we're not clear about this new variant and how, how, how quickly it will spread in the coming weeks. So I think for now they're quite reasonable and we just then monitor uh, trends in infections and, and serious illnesses over the next few weeks to see if further measures are needed, but hopefully not. Professor Majid, we had you on, Gloria and Liam, yesterday, one of a number of academics. You're all monitoring very closely international evidence of Omicron, whether or not it's really serious, whether or not the symptoms are worse or a lot less worse than Delta and other variants that we've seen. Has there been any news over the last 24 hours that you've seen? Uh, so data from South Africa showing that it's putting pressure on the health service. Um, so that's worrying for us if that's going to be happening here as well. But at this stage, we're, we're not quite sure what will happen. We need probably another couple of weeks to fully understand the nature of the virus, how infectious it is, and how serious the infection it causes will be. Uh, so there are, there are some worrying signs from South Africa. At this stage, we're still waiting more data to come through. We should come through in the, in the next uh, two or three weeks. And Professor Chris Whitty at that press conference said... Infections were going up incredibly fast and a serious increase in hospital admissions was probably the way to bet. How under strain already is our health service from the existing coronavirus variants? Uh, so we've seen you know, pictures across you know, the, the, the country in recent weeks and the NHS under great pressure, both hospitals and GP services. So already we're under a lot of pressure, not just from coronavirus, but also from other viruses, from you know, other illnesses, heart disease, cancer. 
uh, long waiting times to see specialists, uh, long waiting times in A&E. So any additional pressure will, you know, will, will cause us great problems, which is why I think government needs to act promptly and you know, quickly to make sure that we uh, don't then place additional pressure on the NHS in the coming weeks and months. What would you say to those, Professor Majid, who say that the government's response is a little bit confusing? We need to uh, mask up when we're on public transport uh, and in shops, but not when we're in pubs and restaurants. To what extent do you think the public uh, might feel that that's a bit of a mixed message? Uh, it, it is a mixed message. So with face masks, you know, the government's going to flip flopped, you know, masks are in and they're out and they're back in again and they extend the masks further. So I think you know, we have to have clear messages all the way through the pandemic rather than this constant change in policies, which I think confuse the public and undermine public confidence in, in these measures. But I agree, you know, pubs do remain dangerous, which is why they are not dangerous, but uh, a place where infections could transmit, which is why the government's looking at other measures like uh, COVID passes to try to bring down risks in places like, like that. Um, you might say that the restrictions that have been brought in are nothing more than an irritant, really. They don't infringe too much on our liberties. But how long might they last? How long might the work from home guidance uh, remain? How long might mandatory mask wearing in crowded places uh, stay in force? Do we have any sense of that? At this stage, we don't know. It all really depends on how quickly this, this new variant Omicron spreads across the country. As I mentioned, that'll take probably a few weeks to understand fully. But I suspect these measures will probably stay in place until the new year, probably at least until we're past Christmas, because uh, people do mix much more of Christmas, which will tend to drive infection numbers up. Um, so I think probably we've got a few weeks of these measures and then we'll review the data and decide whether we need to carry on with them beyond, uh, beyond the new year. Well, Professor Majid, thank you for that. We will stay in touch with you and other experts as the international evidence emerges. Professor Azim Majid there, Professor of Primary Care and Public Health at Imperial College London. Remember to join the debate, email gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. Just after 2.30, we'll be dedicating time to hearing your views. We'll be reading out some of your emails and tweets, so do keep them coming. Up next, the government in Scotland will be outlining its budget this afternoon. We'll be finding out what's in it. Just before that, it's time for your weather forecast. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello again. There's some wet weather around for all of us this evening, but for most of the day, much of central and eastern Britain dry and bright this afternoon. But in the west, we'll start to see the cloud thickening with some outbreaks of rain trickling in. This uh, set of weather fronts responsible for that. Uh, the remnants of Storm Barra clearing away out into the North Sea. We're left with some cloud across the far northeast from that and the odd shower across northern Scotland around lunchtime. But it's this next weather front that will bring patchy rain to Northern Ireland, turning damp this afternoon for Wales and southwest England, whereas much of the Midlands, eastern England and the bulk of eastern Scotland. Dry and bright with some sunshine. Temperatures around about average for the time of year. Turning a little milder in the southwest, but it will also be turning breezier and wetter. In fact, um, we'll all see some rain, I think, through this evening. That rain spreading over the Midlands into eastern England could get quite heavy for a time uh, through the late part of the evening across East Anglia and the southeast before that scoots away during the early hours. And then skies start to clear once more and we're left with a few showers across the west. We'll turn quite cold and as it does so, we could just see things turning a little icy across parts of Scotland. So that's just something to be aware of first thing in the morning. Basically, it's a bright sunny start across much of eastern England and the south. And then we'll see showers developing through the day. Quite a few showers for northwest England, north Wales, northern Ireland, southwest Scotland. Here the showers will come and go throughout. A few for south Wales, southwest England. The odd one getting further east, but much of eastern England, southern England, dry and fine. Temperatures, again, around average, but feeling a little colder because there will be a fairly brisk and chilly wind blowing tomorrow. That'll keep blowing in showers across these western areas well into Friday evening, whereas, again, further east, largely dry and clear, and that hint of blue suggesting quite an early frost, leading to a chilly start to the weekend. But it will slowly turn milder. Bit of a mishmash this weekend. Won't rain all time, all weekend, but there will certainly be some around and it'll be breezy. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. I'm Darren McCaffrey and join me on The Briefing Monday to Thursday at 3pm 
You'll get your afternoon fix of all the latest political stories, debate and analysis, as well as interviews with some of the biggest names in UK politics. It's a problem that affects the whole world, Darren. From Westminster to Cardiff, Edinburgh and Belfast, if it's happening in UK politics, we've got it covered. That's The Briefing with me, Darren McCaffrey, Monday to Thursday, 3pm on GB News. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Now, later this afternoon, the Scottish Government will be outlining its spending plans for the next year. The Finance Secretary, Kate Forbes, has said that she's facing some very difficult choices in drawing up the budget, with COVID-19 still posing, as she calls, acute problems. Our Scotland reporter, David Donaldson, joins us now. David, good to see you. Uh, tell us what's expected in the budget today. Yeah, well, there'll be usual uh, finance put aside for things like health, which takes up 40% of the budget. So uh, we certainly expect that. There's obviously some of the SNP promises as well in terms of free bus travel. So that'll have to be uh, put in there as well. So quite a few things that they're having to agree to already. Obviously, the other thing as well that the SNP have done as well is increase the child payment from £10 to £20. That's going to be paid for somehow. So, uh, again, that'll take up a chunk of the cash as well. So, I mean, there's the normal things you would expect expect uh, the budget to be used for. I think the main thing is that uh, certainly businesses that have suffered across the pandemic, uh, the hospitality industry, uh, the tourism industry, people like that have really, really suffered during the pandemic. We've seen a lot of businesses go under. Uh, some have had to struggle on grants. Obviously, they've had to close. Then they've had to reopen with a range of restrictions, uh, which has impacted on their business. And they'll certainly be hoping to get some money from the Scottish Government to help them keep going. Whether they get that is anyone's guess. Back in May, of course, Davey, the SNP, they didn't quite win a majority at Holyrood. They rely on the seven or so Green Party seats in the Scottish Parliament. This is the first budget we've had under those arrangements with the SNP relying on the Greens to get their business through. How will that change this budget and the thinking of Kate Forbes, the SNP finance minister? Yeah, you would think it would have a bearing on it, the coalition with the Greens. There's no doubt about that. We heard, of course, last week that Shell had pulled out the Campbell oil field. Uh, and, uh, and yesterday, Douglas Ross, the Scottish Conservative leader, having a go at Nicola Sturgeon uh, for her stance in terms of oil and gas in Scotland. And let's not forget, oil and gas brings in billions of pounds worth of revenue. So it's big, big business. There's a lot of people relying on jobs in that industry across, especially the northeast of Scotland and further north in the like 
Lakes of Orkney and Shetland. Uh, so that uh, will be very unpopular uh, if they're not backed. Obviously, Nicola Sturgeon now has a balancing act to do because she has to balance up being in a coalition with the uh, Greens and also helping them out uh, against you know, helping the oil and gas sector as well. So that's going to be a difficult one for her to manage. Kate Forbes, I'm not sure how she's going to manage that in terms of the budget today. That will be revealed later on. I think that, again, is anyone's guess there, really. Uh, but it's going to be a difficult budget for her, no doubt about it. We've got businesses here that have been sinking, like businesses across the UK, who need some money. They need some support. Uh, and we've seen already the new measures that have come in in England. Obviously, they've been in Scotland for a while in terms of double vaccination passports uh, and uh, restrictions here in terms of face masks and things like that. That is carving an impact on business. And businesses here are screaming out, saying, look, we need a help. Whether they're going to get that in today's budget remains to be seen. Particular sectors that have been particularly hard hit, Davy. Sorry? Are there particular sectors? You talked about business wanting more support. Are there particular sectors of business which are pressing for, for more help? Yeah, I mean, it's the obvious candidates, the, the licensing trade, the hospitality industry has been hugely affected uh, by the pandemic. These are the areas that you know, certainly need a hand. There's obviously businesses like you know, tourism businesses as well, which, again, has been hugely hit. And let's not forget, tourism's a massive industry in Scotland. Uh, whiskey and tourism, two of the biggest uh, factors in the country that bring revenue to the country. So something needs to be done to try and help these businesses uh, get forward. I know some businesses have been calling for some support in terms of digitalising business, that may help as well. And I think we may see something along that, those lines today. But it's actual hard cash I think people are looking for uh, and support as well uh, in terms of getting these businesses, keep them uh, running, keep them going. And uh, as I've said before, you know, we're looking now at potentially over the festive season having another raft of restrictions. How's that going to impact in these businesses if they don't get some support? I think we'll find, you don't have to be you know, a scientist to work out that uh, you know, some of them will go under. There's no doubt about that. They need some support from the government to get through this difficult spell and keep going and keep functioning as a business. Thanks very much for that, Davy. Davy Donaldson, GB News Scotland correspondent. Stay with us after the break. It's all about your opinion. Keep those emails coming. Join the debate on De Pierre and Halligan. That's next after the GB News headlines with Olivia Guthrie. Good afternoon. Here are the latest headlines. The Cabinet Secretary will now investigate three alleged parties in Downing Street and Whitehall during lockdown last year. Cabinet Minister Michael Ellis says they're looking into several claims. He also says the Cabinet Office will liaise with police if anything illegal is uncovered. The investigation follows a leaked video showing Number 10 staff laughing about breaking restrictions just days after one of the alleged events. Boris Johnson's facing a revolt from Tory backbenchers who are questioning the government's credibility in enforcing England's Plan B COVID rules. New restrictions ex include extending mandatory masks to indoor public venues such as cinemas and theatres. And a guidance to work from home where possible will return on Monday. Boris Johnson's also facing renewed questions into a donation used to pay for the redecoration of his Downing Street flat. The Conservative Party has been fined almost £18,000 by the Electoral Commission. It says the Tories failed to accurately report a donation and keep a proper accounting record. A party spokesperson said they're considering an appeal. Meanwhile, it's been announced that the Prime Minister will spend some time with his family after his wife Carrie gave birth to a baby girl earlier today. It's the couple's second child after the birth of their son Wilfred in April 2020. A spokeswoman for the couple has said both mother and daughter are doing very well. I'll have a full update for you on today's main stories at the top of the hour.
You're watching GB News Live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. We have been discussing Boris Johnson's new COVID restrictions in England to try and stem the spread of the Omicron variant. But do you know what these restrictions are and how they'll affect you? We're speaking to a host of guests to find out how these restrictions affect them and us. First up, it's Michael Kill, who's the CEO of the Nighttime Industries Association. Michael, thanks a lot for joining us as ever. How will these Plan B restrictions affect the nighttime economy? Well, as you can appreciate, I mean, it's a, uh, a very fragile industry at the moment. And with three weeks to go to Christmas at a key time where people start to build cash reserves for the survival period of the very slow months of January and February, these additional restrictions on top of the mitigations that are already in place are going to create some barriers. And without a doubt, what we've seen from Scotland and Wales is we see a drop off in trade uh, and additional costs, which is with you know, in many ways, going to compromise the industry as a whole. Some might argue that vaccine passports at least ensure that you're able to stay open. Well, it's an interesting one with vaccine passports because many of the bigger size venues actually do negative tests on entry. Uh, the actual uh, COVID passport, which includes the double vax, the double vax actually, all it does is suppresses the impact uh, in terms of the double vax, only suppresses the impact on the NHS. It doesn't actually tell you whether you've got a virus at the time. So the key to this is understanding whether people accessing the settings have a virus at the time so that they're not transmissible. So in many respects, it's an additional barrier that potentially is going to cause some uh, disparity in, in, in terms of people showing, and, and we're seeing that with some of the drop-offs in, in ticket sales, refund requests, and cancellations of parties, as we've seen with the mis-messaging from government over the last week. It seems a long time ago, Michael, but it was Freedom Day, so-called, back in mid-July, when the anti-COVID restrictions almost entirely disappeared. To what extent did the nighttime economy, the nightclub industry, and so on, live music bounce back? after that was announced? Well, look, as you can appreciate, the 19th of July after a 20-month closure period was, was very, very difficult. Uh, many people have been overburdened with debt. So they've got rents above, you know, hanging over their head, something like £2.6 billion pounds worth of debt across the sector. So it, it was great to be open. And, and we took the decision as an industry to be sensible and play our part in ensuring that public health was... was uh, 
you know, kept up in terms of what we had to do. We looked at testing, we looked at sanitation, ventilation, all of the key recommendations from government. And contrary to popular belief from clinicians and scientists, we didn't see the influx in transmission that was expected. And that's that's testament to the industry doing the job they were asked to do. So at the moment, they feel very aggrieved at the fact that three weeks before Christmas, at a key point, they're having these restrictions uh, placed against them, which is going to impact the industry and will potentially affect survival in the early part of next year. Are young people as keen to go clubbing as they ever have been? Or has there been some change in the way that we socialise as a result of not being able to do so for so long? Uh, I think without a doubt. I mean, look, look uh, you know, you can't suggest in, in any minute that Wales and Scotland haven't seen market distortion, uh, where people are, you know, uh, are sceptical against, uh, against vaccinations. They don't want to tie up to the COVID passport um, uh, sort of app position, which is being sort of pushed by government. But what we're seeing is counterproductive position. That There is a concern that during the Christmas and New Year's Eve period, we are going to see an influx of illegal parties and events, which is counterproductive. So, you know, you've got to ask your question, do you want people to go to safe well-managed, regulated environments with mitigations in place, or do you want them going to house parties and illegal events, which potentially are going to stem or start to increase those transmission uh, rates amongst young people who, who don't want to attend venues because of, of, of those barriers? You lose a spontaneity, though, of going to a club, don't you, if you have to do the paperwork and so on. You know, you're in a pub with friends, you think, oh, let's go on to a, to a nightclub. Obviously, that's going to hit your industry. On the other hand, Michael, I know it's difficult, but it could be a lot worse. Pubs and restaurants, they are still open. Yeah, and I, and I, I understand where you're coming from, but it, it's, you know, let's, let's draw back to see how many of those transmissions come from our settings. And that's the one bit of information that we're, we're missing. So, you know, and we're aware of the, the limited amount of transmission coming from our settings because of the extraordinary work the sector has done and the, the investment that they've made and commitment to the public health strategy. So I think we've played our part. And without a doubt, there are other settings that have a lot stronger uh, and higher transmission rates that could have been mitigated against. But it seems like, once again, through this roller coaster that we've seen over the last two years, we're being targeted as an easy option and possibly a political and public uh, scapegoat for this position, which is hugely concerning given the importance of this period. Michael Kill, CEO of the Nighttime Industries Association, thanks for your time today and all the best to you and your members. Barbara McNaughton Cartry, who is a salon owner, hair salon owner from Oxted in Surrey, joins us now. Barbara, hi, nice to see you. Uh, how do you feel about, I guess it's the work from home guidance that might have the biggest impact on your salon. Am I right? Yes, absolutely. It's, um, well, I guess th there's two sides to that. I mean, generally, our industry has never not been in restrictions since this all began. Most salons have never stepped away from using masks and, you know, distancing is very different in our industry. You know, we feel that um, obviously as hair salons, we can't work from home, hair stylists can't work from home. Um, but however, kind of with the nighttime economy, what we have done as an industry is create amazingly safe spaces. So, you know, we've been incredibly mindful of what type of things we can have in place so that clients feel protected, feel safe when they're in here. And, you know, I don't have a mask on now, but in salons, we've never actually stopped wearing masks for the most part. So, you know, the fear is though, that people won't feel comfortable to come out and have their hair done as if, you know, maybe go to a restaurant or go shopping. Um, so it's, it's trying to keep that momentum as we come up to Christmas and keep our sector and our businesses and industry safe. So-called SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, they're the lifeblood of the British economy, Barbara. It's small firms like yours that employ most people, drive our growth. How have you been faring? You're putting on a brave face, you've got a nice smile, but have you worried about the survival of the business that you've built during this pandemic? Do you worry about its survival now? Most definitely. I think it's 
you know, we took for granted, I think, a lot of things because, you know, high streets in, in Britain have been the backbone of communities. And although there were changes and we were seeing those changes, the, the speed of change now, it's, you know, most high streets are unrecognisable to what they were previous to March 2020. And I think where we feel the most um, fear, I guess, if you like, is where the government don't seem to be giving an equal um, an equal playing field and equal to support to all the businesses on the high street. So salons, we've always been key to actually bringing people to our great high streets and, you know, by appointment, we're responsible for bringing football enormously to the high streets. And we feel that as an industry, we're definitely have not been given the same support as other sectors like hospitality and that, you know, just making that playing field easier and more equal would have a huge difference. But it is a worry at this time of year, you know, as the nighttime industry gentleman was saying, if we don't get a stronghold and strengthen our businesses now, it's very much more difficult in January and February. The Christmas party has been saved, though. How <laughs> big a part of your business is that Christmas party blow dry? It's, you know, it's really funny, but when things are like they are now and people feel a little bit, you know, like, ooh, what's going on and a bit vulnerable, then having your hair done is always the best boost ever. But, you know, having your hair done for an evening out, um, you know, just makes all the difference in the world. So, you know, we pride ourselves in, in how we look after clients here. And in fact, we've been in business 40 years next year. I can't believe that. I don't know whether to be pleased or horrified, but, you know, I think what we do matters and industries like ours make people feel better. And when you feel better, you're going to make you know, the lives of everyone around you better. So, you know, it's it's pivotal whether you're having a party or not, get your hair done. <laughs> Hairdressers, talk to people. You're always a good gauge of public opinion, as every local newspaper journalist knows. What are your customers saying, Barbara? Are they scared in the main or do they feel the government's overreacted? What do you think? I think in the main, people feel frustrated. People want life to feel better and feel more normal. They want to feel that they can, as you were saying a moment ago, spontaneously go and spend time with friends, go to, you know, go somewhere. We crave that connection and those feelings. So I think I would say it's more frustration than fear, most definitely. Whereas last year there was more fear. I'd say this year it's more frustration with what's going on. Have you had any customers refuse to wear masks? We've been really lucky in that we have our, our salon has different private areas. So if we have a client who has exemptions for certain reasons, then we can make them feel comfortable and other clients comfortable in the, you know, well, why hasn't she got a mask on that kind of thing. But we've been really lucky that we haven't had any of the things that we've read about where people have taken a stand that they're just not going to wear it just because. So, you know, I haven't had any experience of that myself. Barbara McNaughton Cartry, salon owner, Oxted in Surrey. Thanks a lot for joining us here on GB News. Very interesting. And best of luck keeping your business going. Now let's speak with a psychologist, Emma Kenny. Emma, are people just feeling... I mean, th these restrictions, they're not sort of life changing, are they? They might be a bit irritated uh, by them. How would you sum up how the nation is feeling? I think frustrated was a really good use word to use. I also think quite angry and I also think quite confused. And on top of that, I know that we're saying that it doesn't signify the biggest of restrictions and changes. But when you're starting to say that people can't get into a nightclub without a vaccine passport, that's a massive infringement on rights and a massive infringement of democracy. So. To some degree, even if you just think about it in that capacity, that's going to change people's mindset towards the country they live in because it's become segregated, whether we like to acknowledge that or otherwise. So on a mental health level, that's really scary for people. Gloria's right, isn't she, Emma, that for individuals, these aren't particularly onerous restrictions, annoying, irritating, a good words to use, I agree. On the other hand, if you're trying to run a business that's right on the edge, this could tip you... Uh, into bankruptcy. You won't be building up the reserves of cash as many businesses do in the run-up to Christmas. That's going to affect the kind of psychological makeup of the nation, isn't it? Because in the end, businesses are run by people. They're run by families. They're run by ordinary men and women in many cases. 
Absolutely. And lots of these industries have already been affected by not getting any support really financially apart from loans throughout the whole crisis. So they were already at the back store of being able to promote their own well-being within that experience financially. Add to that the fact that now, you know, people have said things that have made people cancel all their Christmas parties. Add to that the fact that you're not going to coerce and force people who don't want a vaccine into a vaccine. So they won't go to nightclubs. It's as simple as that. Young people are actually really savvy. They're not stupid. They know when they're being forced into something, whether you call it by another name or otherwise. So psychologically, for the people who are trying to just create great environments for people to come and enjoy themselves, because dancing, for example, that is such a big part of our human condition. It's to do with our tribal experience. You know, we go and we let loose. For well-being, it's amazing. So it's not just that it's taking away from the families who are creating these amazing opportunities for us to go and enjoy ourselves. It's taking away from the very human core spirit which is to be free and enjoy that freedom and express that freedom through dance. And we've had that forever. And it's completely insane to me what we're doing to an already decimated area of hospitality. So I think the psychological well-being of the nation is at an all-time low. That's certainly booked by the research that's coming out. And even though these restrictions aren't as terrible yet as last year, it certainly says that life as we know it has changed. And I think that for anybody who's living in our world right now, particularly in the UK, who's been very used to just being able to go about their business without any concern, it does feel incredibly restrictive psychologically, not necessarily because of the restrictions now, but because of what it says about what might happen tomorrow or next week or next year. And unfortunately, that's a position where you feel anxious because you don't know what's going to happen next. And life is never secure. Of course it isn't. The psychological condition of security is a myth. But usually we're able to bank on the leaders of our country having the best interests at heart. And it hasn't felt like that for a long time yet. Some people really like working from home. For others, yeah. it can cause depression and anxiety. What particular groups of people are susceptible to isolation that comes from working from home? I think that's a really good question because I think that we've stopped talking about one of the biggest killers, which is social isolation. Until the pandemic, we talked about that constantly. The NHS were massively around the fact that social isolation will literally reduce the years that you have on this planet. And now we don't like to talk about that because that doesn't fit the narrative. Secondly, the best thing to come out of the pandemic without a doubt in essence, is the fact that now people can work at home, which is great for women who used to have a glass ceiling a lot of the time because of the nurture for the children. So there are some great bits there. But when it comes down to the kind of people who suffer when they're socially isolated, obviously we know the elderly awfully suffer, but also young people, because any form of socialization, social isolation is bad for you because you need people around you, you need community support, you need to be able to reach out, you need those kind of cooler you know, water cooler conversations that you have at work where you just take five minutes to decompress. And what we also know about people working at home is that very often trying to multitask, dealing with the kids and so on and so forth, so they get a lot of stress. And also they work longer because they can answer the emails at one o'clock in the morning. So there are these good points and bad elements there. And I wouldn't say that working from home is terrible if you like it. And I think it's fantastic that people have got the option to do that. I think that should be something that we should carry on forever because it makes a big difference to people's well-being. But for those who don't don't like it, then they should be able to go into work. You know, when you think about the advice and guidance, it's nonsensical because you can say that people can go into work or can work from home. And therefore, really, is that going to have an impact on the virus? It just doesn't really play out. But if we're going to say for people's well-being, is working at home a great thing? Yes, it is. If you love it, as long as you get breaks and equally, it's being around your colleagues like you are right now. Is that a good thing? Brilliant. Because mental wellness is very much formed from our minute interactions with people we have on a regular basis and also the more interactions that we have with people we like and the more time we spend around people we love the longer our lifespan so it's actually good for giving us a longer life and benefits health full stop emma opinion polls show there's some evidence that the public's becoming a little bit more skeptical of anti-covid restrictions <laughs> certainly a little less tolerant as a psychologist is something is that shift in public mood, something that you recognise? Do you think it's there? And do the recent political scandals surrounding parties in Downing Street, if they do undermine public trust, won't they add to that shift in public mood? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the trust in the government has just been shot recently. I mean, I think it's happened time and time and time again. And with respect, I don't even blame the government for wanting to hang out with each other and have parties because that's just part of human instinct. But what it said to us is when we were dealing with scenarios where I had to deal with people whose parents were dying and they couldn't see them last year, 
and where people fundamentally were separated and segregated from the families that they love, causing them deep psychological distress, to know that that didn't play out in the government who's meant to be leading us is obviously going to cause a deep sense of frustration and also retaliation and retribution to some degree. I think what we've got to do now is recognise that it's completely natural after nearly two years to feel very frustrated, deeply unhappy about the situations that are unfolding, and very sceptical because things don't make sense. And what annoys me about the way that we're treated as a general public, and this happens constantly, is it feels like they underestimate the average intelligence of human beings. We're incredibly discerning. We're very analytical. When something smells off, it's because it's off. And while some people are highly traumatized, and that means they will do whatever they're told, because understandably, they've had their sense of safety absolutely broken down. They might have lost people during this period of time, so it feels very present and real for them. You have those individuals who are having a horrific time and still feel terrified. Equally, you have people hugely desensitized now. They don't care what they hear because it feels like it didn't play out in reality for them. So on both levels of the spectrum, we have an issue there. So what the best would happen now is that they start saying, you are human beings with autonomous choice, make the right decisions for yourself and carry on with your lives instead of being terrified about something that may happen because it is going to happen. Every single one of us is going to have to come to terms with our mortality. The sooner we do that, the better we will be able to live fully in the present moment, as opposed to being directed by a group of people who can't even follow their own advice and guidance. Emma Kenny, psychologist, thanks a lot for joining us on GB News and a nice Christmas tree there in the background. We've been asking you whether you know about these new restrictions and what they mean for you, and you've been getting in touch with us here. Marianne emailed us to say everyone was complaining because they didn't act early enough last Christmas. Now that they are, that's wrong too. Arthur says there's a massive backlog of patients awaiting surgery. These people will not get their operations if hospitals are forced to deal with increasing numbers of Omicron cases. Simon emailed us gbviews at gbnews.uk and said the announcement by Boris Johnson for COVID vaccine passports and the hints of compulsory vaccination goes against the ethos and values of the Conservative Party. The fact that he announced this means that no matter the outcome, I can never support nor vote for him ever again. Natalie says we need to get on with life now and learn to live with COVID. Jones got in touch to say Boris has had a very difficult time with Brexit and COVID and this should be appreciated. Patricia says I don't see how vaccine passports can protect us because you can still carry COVID and pass it on even if you've been double vaccinated. And Rob emailed us, there is not and never will be any justification for vaccine passports. Steph says I feel much safer knowing that there are going to be vaccine passports and when I go into larger venues I will feel a lot more comfortable. I wish they'd started them sooner. Abdul says, I really feel for all of the businesses that will once again take another hit from the pandemic. It's not fair on them. So many people have lost their businesses because of the pandemic. A really broad range of views there from our GB News viewers. You've been watching to Pierre and Halligan on GB News. We are back together on Monday at 2. Thanks for watching. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello again. There's some wet weather around for all of us this evening, but for most of the day, much of central and eastern Britain dry and bright this afternoon. But in the west, we'll start to see the cloud thickening with some outbreaks of rain trickling in. This uh, set of weather fronts responsible for that. Uh, the remnants of Storm Barra clearing away out into the North Sea. We're left with some cloud across the far northeast from that and the odd shower across northern Scotland around lunchtime. But it's this next weather front that will bring patchy rain to Northern Ireland, turning damp this afternoon for Wales and southwest England, whereas much of the Midlands, eastern England and the bulk of eastern Scotland. Dry and bright with some sunshine. Temperatures around about average for the time of year. Turning a little milder in the southwest, but it will also be turning breezier and wetter. In fact, um, we'll all see some rain, I think, through this evening. That rain spreading over the Midlands into eastern England could get quite heavy for a time uh, through the late part of the evening across East Anglia and the southeast before that scoots away during the early hours. And then skies start to clear once more and we're left with a few showers across the west. We'll turn quite cold and as it does so, we could just see things turning a little icy across parts of Scotland. So that's just something to be aware of first thing in the morning. Basically, it's a bright sunny start across much of eastern England and the south. And then we'll see showers developing through the day. Quite a few showers for northwest England, north Wales, northern Ireland, southwest Scotland. Here the showers will come and go throughout. A few for south Wales, southwest England. 
The odd one getting further east, but much of eastern England, southern England, dry and fine. Temperatures again around average, but feeling a little colder because there will be a fairly brisk and chilly wind blowing tomorrow. That'll keep blowing in showers across these western areas well into Friday evening, whereas again, further east, largely dry and clear, and that hint of blue suggesting quite an early frost, leading to a chilly start to the weekends, but it will slowly turn milder. Bit of a mishmash this weekend. Won't rain all time, all weekend, but there will certainly be some around and it'll be breezy. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Join me, Alex Phillips, for the afternoon agenda on GB News, Monday to Thursday from 4pm till 6pm. We don't lecture to you or try to tell you what to think. We do a deep delve into a topic with views from across the range of debate, therefore leaving you 